let's get into it. Before we get too far, we do want to acknowledge that Windsor Essex sits on the traditional territory of the Three Fires Confederacy of First Nations, which includes the Ojibwa, the Ottawa, and the Potawatomi. We respect the longstanding relationships with First Nations people in this place in the 100 mile Windsor Essex Peninsula in the Straits of Detroit. Today, we are celebrating the official kickoff of the C3 Tech Cycling Hackathon. This is a month long endeavor to build digital tools that will improve cycling in Windsor and Essex County. This project was originally started, originally launched back in February of this year, even if we did get things started a little bit prior to that. So over the last few months, we have run a few different events that have been focused on community building, connecting the cycling and technology communities, and getting a sense of what cyclists want to see in terms of technology. So we're going to be talking a little bit more about all of that today, but the focus is of course on what this hackathon is, why we're doing it, and how everyone can expect it to run. To close us out today, we are going to be having a roundtable discussion that will hopefully help to get everyone in the mindset of why active transportation is important and the role technology can play in making it more realistic to happen in Windsor, Essex. So to start, I'm going to read a statement provided by Kieran McKenzie, who is the councillor for Ward 9 in the city of Windsor. He is also the chair of the Windsor Bicycling Committee. Kieran is actually the reason that C3 Tech exists. He brought this idea to Doug Sartori, oh man, I think over a year ago now. It took a while to get that, to get everything up and running. And since then, we have grown to include a number of different sponsors including CWATS through the County of Essex, the Ontario Tourism Innovation Lab, Parallel 42 Systems, and Share the Road Essex County. So Kieran's statement, the mandate of the Windsor Bicycling Committee is to enhance the safety and viability of biking in the city of Windsor. To that end, Kieran was proud as chair that they supported an initiative to make cycling more accessible to people in our community by working to create a digital tool that will identify the safest and most efficient ways people can leverage our active transportation infrastructure to meet their transportation needs. This concept has evolved to now include incredible partners in the tech space, including Hackforge and Parallel 42 Systems, as well as a regional transportation partner, the Countywide Active Transportation System, otherwise known as CWATS. Working together with these partners and other stakeholders, as well as the public, will help us to create a tool that will put more riders on the streets and help us as a region to realize all of the social, environmental, economic, and public health benefits that active transportation can create. So again, that was on behalf of Kieran McKenzie, Chair of the City of Windsor Bicycling Committee and Windsor City Councillor. I am now going to pass it over to Justin from the Ontario Tourism Innovation Lab, our official tourism partner. Thanks so much, Lauren. Hello, everyone. So great to be here. I'm really excited to hear the discussion and, of course, um, uh, the outcome of the hackathon uh, over the next few weeks. Uh, my name is Justin LaFontaine. I'm the program lead with the Tourism Innovation Lab uh, and also wearing a couple of other hats. Um, I'm also a board member of Bike Windsor Essex, and I'm an avid year-round cyclist and advocate. Uh, I'm, I live in Kingsville, uh, but I've also lived in Windsor. I've been involved in a number of uh, cycling initiatives in this region and across Ontario. Uh, really see the opportunity and, and um, uh, yeah, just congratulate uh, Lauren and the C3 Tech team uh, for bringing us here today. And, and again, the Tourism Innovation Lab's really keen uh, uh, and excited to be a partner. Uh, I'll just uh, share very briefly about who we are. We're a nonprofit tourism development incubator that was started in 2018 with a pilot actually right here in Windsor, Essex. We're proudly based in this region. Uh, and since 2018, we've ex expanded our, our programs and activities across Ontario uh, and now in British Columbia. So uh, we're now a national program. Uh, so you might see our acronyms uh, uh, O-T-I-L, and now we're somewhat transitioning to the T-I-L, uh, just reflecting that. Um, 
Yeah, and just uh, to share a thought, um, I'm not from this region originally. I, I grew up in Toronto. I lived in Montreal, New York, uh, Wolf Island near King Kingston, um, all over the place. And what really drew me to this area, being someone that rides a bike year round, uh, for you know going to the grocery store, for work, for recreation, was you know the enormous opportunity you know in terms of what we have currently, but you know where we could go. Uh, so this tool that is being developed, I think, is so important uh, to take us to that next level and really make Windsor Essex a leading cycling and cycle tourism destination in Ontario. Um, and I guess I'll also say, um, connecting back to the Tourism Innovation Lab, uh, we are a program at Pack Forge, so we're essentially a sister organization, sorry, a sister program to the C3 Tech Initiative, um, and we do have one of our goals. Uh, is to you know collaborate more and connect with the tourism, uh, sorry, the, the tech sector uh, and connect with the, our tourism colleagues as well. So with that, I'll just say, if you're not familiar with us, uh, go to tourisminnovation.ca uh, and you'll find out uh, all the full details. Uh, and I'll also just uh, mention the Bike Winds Arrestix website, of course, is bikewindsarrestix.com. So with that, I will hand it over to Chris to uh, speak on behalf of CWATS. Thanks, Justin. Everyone hear me? Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. So, hi everyone. My name is Christopher Burford. For those of you who have not met me yet, uh, I do work with P42 Systems. I'm here to support our teams and our mentors during some of these hackathon events over the next month. Lauren and I both would be very happy to answer any questions that our mentors and teams have uh, throughout the entire hackathon. Uh, we are in all channels. I am in each of your team channels, so uh, please reach out to me there if you'd like, and we will also have our emails. So CWATS is unable to be present today, uh, but they were able to send us a small message that I will now read. The countywide active transportation system is an ever-expanding network of bicycle lanes, multi-purpose pathways, paved shoulders, and shared roadways. The system aims to connect Essex County's seven municipalities with bike trails and to tie in the existing routes in Windsor and Chatham County. Since 2012, more than 415 kilometers of active transportation corridors have been constructed. Active transportation coordinator for the County of Essex, Diana, Diana Radzilescu, has told us that CWATS is excited to partner with the Windsor Bicycling Committee in creating a regional cycling app. We wanna make it as easy as possible for cyclists to navigate the connections between the active transportation routes in Essex County, Windsor, and Chatham County. Okay, thanks, Lauren. I'll pass it back to you. Excellent, thank you so much, Chris. So now I'm going to talk a little bit more about what CWATS is. I did mention it a little bit earlier, but for anyone who has missed any of our prior information sessions. I just wanna let you know a little bit more about why we're doing this. C3 Tech, which stands for City County Cycling Technology, is an initiative that aims to provide accurate and comprehensive information on cycling routes throughout the region. We will use crowdsourced information and open source software to bring the cycling and tech communities together so they can build the maps and tools that will help cyclists to navigate the area. To get this started, we recently launched WindsorEssexCycling.ca. I'm always afraid I'm going to say it backwards, but it's definitely Windsor Essex Cycling. Uh, and we also spent some time gathering feedback from cyclists throughout the region. We asked them what features they would like to see in a local cycling app and if there are any digital tools they currently use. So we gathered this information through online surveys as well as through some digital uh, town hall events. I'm also going to say hi to Jude because I see that he put the little headphone in there, Jess. So hi, Jude. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> okay, great. So, oh, that's not Jude. That's Vinny. I apologize. Oh my goodness. Uh, so <laughs> now that I'm done being distracted by Jess's adorable babies, <laughs> we are going to take a look at some of the potential development ideas that we received during those sessions speaking with local cyclists. So when we spoke with these cyclists or bicycle riders, however they prefer to be referred to, 
we had responses for people that live all over the county that have various levels of experience with cycling that ride different types of bikes and in many cases we received some similar feedback one of the biggest complaints that i have heard about the regional cycling trails is that there is no comprehensive map that shows all city and county cycling trails in a single place everyone's clicking around between different municipality websites to find this information and it can be very frustrating so we will try to solve that one we've also had people request the ability to report lane and path obstructions there has been a request for this to be available to other cyclists as well as to the municipalities themselves Obviously, tying in with the municipal system is not as simple as simply making something available on an app for public consumption, but we will see what we can do. This is something that I personally would love to see. There are so many times that I've had a truck parked in my bike lane for like three weeks and I'm trying to go to work and the truck's in my way. It's super frustrating. We also can experience this after storms when branches and other fallen trees might be in the way of some of our more nature type trails so this one would be really cool if we can work that out offline use is another major concern if you ever venture outside of windsor and you happen to have certain cell phone providers you will find that once you get out to essex staples cotton there is no cell phone service some people also choose not to have data. There we go. They stick with just Wi-Fi. So being able to offer something offline is going to be a huge plus for this project. Users would also like to be able to distinguish between multi-use and bike-specific paths. There are also a large number of users who are already using some sort of device for tracking and following their routes. So we have people using Garmin, Apple Watch, and a few other technological devices. So if we are able to work with those existing technologies to provide direction information there, it would be of major use to the cyclists that we're looking to serve. So after that, I am going to talk a little bit about a more specific project that was brought on by one of our sponsors. So I believe Tom is on the call here today. So Tom Olmsted, he is one of the co-founders of Share the Road Windsor Essex, is a huge proponent of the idea of comfort mapping. So what they are looking to do with comfort mapping is provide safe and accessible routes for people to move around the city and county. So if we take a look here, at the top of this slide, we are seeing the route suggested by default by Google Maps. If you wanted to go from down to from the university to basically uh, just outside of Riverside, it looks like there. Yes. See, I tried to move my own graphic that I put on there. It's not going to work. So taking that route is going to bring you along Riverside Drive basically the whole way. If anyone here has ever cycled on Riverside Drive, it is not the most fun place to ride your bike. Tom recognizes this and would like to create an app that automatically discludes roads that are unsafe for cyclists. So in his map here at the bottom, he first sends the rider along the Riverside Trail, which has no traffic, so it's quite safe for cyclists as long as you're paying attention and watching for small children. After that, we follow a number of smaller back roads that while do end up taking us a little bit longer in terms of both distance and time, the safety factor is huge. So Tom has a lot of plans for how he would love to see this idea realized. And to help make that happen, he has offered a $500 prize to the team or individual who can best bring this vision to life. I want to make sure that all of our attendees are aware of the fact that in order to qualify for this $500 prize, you do have to meet with Tom at least once for a video call throughout the next five weeks to make sure that you are actually creating the tool he wants to see. 
So as I mentioned earlier, Tom is part of Share the Road Essex County, who is a grassroots advocacy group focused on ensuring that all cyclists are able to safely navigate the region. As I mentioned, he, Tom, uh, believes that the current cycling navigation tools really don't consider cyclists when choosing routes. It just goes by what is the most direct. Uh, as an avid cyclist himself, Tom knows this, that some roadways are be better suited to cyclists than others. And he wants to make sure that we make these available to visitors as well as residents. His vision includes a primary loop that provides a safe route around the county. And he's also looking to remove certain streets like Riverside Drive from the routing options completely. So that should be a fun one. I'm really looking forward to seeing how Tom is able to work with our participants to bring that one to life. From there, I am going to pass things over to Doug Sartori, who is representing one of our other sponsors, Parallel 42 Systems. Go ahead, Doug. Thanks, Lauren. Um, my contribution today is to just elaborate a little bit on um, the stack of technologies um, that we're using uh, for WindsorEssexCycling.ca and throw out a few ideas and ways that um, your team might want to engage with this data or with the code that's already out there. Um, Lauren has introduced WindsorEssexCycling.ca. That is the community cycle mapping project that we're adopting for C3 Tech. It's a fork of the Cycle OSM demonstration project. Let me unpack that a little bit for you folks. In open source software, a fork happens when a group splits an existing open source project into a new one. So we've borrowed Cycle OSM's code and tech stack in order to give us a head start on building a cycle application for Windsor Essex. Cycle OSM is a map style defined for Carto CSS, which is a style sheet preprocessor developed by Mapbox. The Cycle OSM style surfaces map data, including OpenStreetMap data, in a way that highlights information that's important to cyclists. Rendering map data in a browser requires a few components. In our stack, all of these components are open to modification by the community. Your project could build on any of the components in the stack from the basic map data all the way up to the user-facing applications. I'm going to list the components and just give you a few ideas for how a hackathon project might work with each of them. Starting with the data itself, uh, our data is provided by OpenStreetMap, which anyone can modify, kind of like the Wikipedia of maps. It's a worldwide map um, that relies on user contributions. You can modify or extract this data for your own purposes. You might create an app that uses OSM data to help cyclists keep track of which community trails they've cycled and for how far, or set up a website for people to build and upload their own cycling routes. You could use OSM data in an app that lets people identify an amenity they'd like to cycle to, like the nearest ice cream parlor or a coffee shop and provide turn-by-turn -turn navigation. You could use OSM data to set up a list of trails and cycling infrastructure that identifies all the amenities available on the route. Carto CSS, which I mentioned before, is a, a tool that defines the way OpenStreetMap data is rendered. Um, also, a tile server is required that provides the map tiles to applications. You can sometimes see the map tiles if you're on a slower internet connection and you load up Google Maps or some other tool and you'll see those squares kind of render one by one. Those are map tiles. You could tweak the CSS that defines the map to provide special maps for park trails or a tourism oriented map for the Essex wine route that gives visitors the information they need to cycle between wineries in the county um, and then set up a tile server that provides these maps. To render maps on the web, you need a web application that surfaces the map tiles and provides ways for users to interact with it. The Windsor Essex Cycling web application uses Leaflet to surface the Cycle OSM map using a variety of tile servers. You could help make this app better, or you could use it as the basis for your own map based application. Maybe you'd like to combine other open data with the application, like City of Windsor data on heritage buildings, to create an app for cyclists to discover the history of our community. 
or an app that combines the cycling map with the coordinates of murals, statues, and other public art. You could give users an interface to define their own waypoints and markers that they can store on their device. Combine city and county transit routes with Cycle OSM to create a Windsor-Essex tool for planning your daily commute by bike and bus. There is a ton of valuable data on local open data portals that you can leverage. When I'm finished chatting, I'll, I'll drop some links in, in, the, uh, in the chat to uh, help you get started. Um, finally, the last thing I want to mention is vRouter, um, which is a web application. Uh, it is part of the Windsor-Essex Cycling app. Um, and it provides routing and allows users to upload and download GPS traces. We've got some suggestions and bounties from the community about how the routing app could be better already, but there are other directions that you could take it. You could build a smartphone app that creates GPS traces and let users upload their routes for others to enjoy graded by difficulty. There's a whole universe of things that you can do and um, the, the limit is only really constrained by your abilities and your imagination. Um, and again, I'm gonna drop a few links in the chat that will um, help to get you started. Thanks for your time and over to you, Lauren. Thank you so much, Doug. Really appreciate that awesome insight. And for anyone who is watching right now and maybe doesn't manage to catch those links as Doug drops them, I'll be making sure to include those on the follow-up email that will be going out to all participants. So after that, let's take a look at all of the prizes we have available. I mentioned earlier the $500 offered by Tom and Share the Road Essex County, but we have an additional $500. This one has been provided to us courtesy of the Ontario Tourism Innovation Lab, who we are very happy to have partnered with for a number of reasons, and they are the official tourism partner of C3 Tech. This is more of a best in show prize. So this is going to be available to the team who delivers the best execution of the best idea as determined by the event judges. This will also have to adhere to the C3 Tech goal of making cycling in Windsor, Essex safer, easier, and more fulfilling. So make sure to keep that in mind as you're building out your projects. Improving cycling for cyclists in the area is really the main goal of this. Now, I did mention that that prize is going to be determined by our event judges. So let's talk a little bit more about who exactly those judges are. I'm going to bring back my colleague, Chris, to talk a little bit more about that part. Thank you. Beautiful, okay. So we have three members of the local tech and cycling communities that will assess the projects based on how well the idea meets our project mandate and the quality of the technology used to build it. We obviously aren't uh, expecting release ready code, but just a proof of concept. So this is a lot more about exploration and seeing what you can build, um, build here and not, uh, not necessarily something that we're just gonna uh, implement and that's like you've solved the entire initiative in one go here. So we have a number of judges. Adam Castle, who is the Director of Venture Services at WeTech. Uh, a little bit on him. He is a, cell, uh, a startup program developer, growth coach, and a mental health ambassador. He was recently honored with uh, the United Way's uh, 40 leaders under 40 for the Windsor-Essex region. Uh, he's worked with countless businesses locally on their market entry and growth strategies and business models. So he's a very powerful resource for our tech community. Make sure um, we'll make sure that uh, you've all connected with him a little bit at some point in this call. I'm sorry, not this call, but this hackathon. Kieran McKenzie as well could not be here today. Uh, Kieran is Windsor's Ward 9 counselor and chairperson at the Essex Region Conservation of Authority. Conservation Authority, IRCA. He's experienced in the areas of public policy development and strategic communications. He's the founder of founder and president of an independent media company, Rose City Politics, and has a ton of experience specifically in the not-for-profit sector. So he's also a very strong presence in our community, and we welcome him here, although he couldn't be here today. Finally, Doug Sartori will be uh, uh, another judge. He is here today. 
He's the principal consultant at Parallel 42 Systems. Uh, he has been the chairperson of the board of directors for Workforce Windsor Essex and the past board president for Hackforge. Additionally, a little uh, blurb for you, Doug. You were recently awarded with the Tech Mentor of the Year from the WeTech Alliance. So congratulations to you on that. <laughs> yeah, little snaps. Um, there we go, there we go. <laughs> Additionally, Justin Lafontaine, Program Lead of Tourism Innovation Lab, uh, Board Member for Bike Windsor Essex, and Tom Olmsted. Uh, so, the last, so the last three that I've mentioned are all on the call here today. Uh, Tom is, again, co-founder of Share the Road, Essex County. Uh, so perhaps later in this discussion, we'll hear a little bit about how the judges would, uh, what they're looking for and that, that'd be very informative for everyone. Uh, sorry, Doug. Uh, so am I not coming clear? Am I not audible for everybody? You're okay on this end, so um, it may be okay. the, uh, um, the person who uh, mentioned that maybe just their internet connection. Oh, okay. Okay, I'll continue then. Sound good? Alrighty. So there are judges. We will hear a little bit from some of them later as well. As for our mentors, we have a strong lineup of mentors that all teams can use as resources. So to help participants during the hackathon, uh, we've gathered a team of mentors to provide guidance and advice on project ideas and execution. Each mentor offers his own specialization. Participants can connect with them through their Discord channels and over video chats during the mentor's specified office hours, which we will make available to you. More information about mentor availability will be emailed to participants following today's events. But for now, let's list them out. So, Doug Sartori, again, I'm very grateful to have you on the mentor list. He is a supporter of free software and open data. Doug is interested in making public information available and accessible to everyone in the community. His specialties are mapping, data, and backend development. Tom Olmsted will, uh, would also very much like to volunteer, and we're so grateful for uh, his expertise on the opposite side of this. Tom is an avid outdoorsman and co-founder of Share the Road. He's a great believer in teamwork, make the dream work. Teamwork makes the dream work. Uh, and he gains satisfaction from collaborating with other community members to help improve the quality of our life in this area. His specialties are on the cycling side of things, community building, and uh, which could very much help here is brand development as well. Aaron Mavernack, uh, who is present here with us today, has over 20 years of experience in software development and hardware design experience. Professionally, he has worked in advanced research and development of autonomous vehicles, in manufacturing automation, and in the development of diverse embedded systems. So his specialties would be software development, AI, and electronics. John Haldeman is an information security analyst and software developer with IBM. Part of his job is developing metrics and visualizations to help understand computer security systems. Visualization of open, uh, of open data is a hobby of his. So uh, we'll list his specialties, which are data visualization, information security, and JavaScript. And our fifth mentor is Randy Topliff. Randy has over 10 years of experience as a software developer. He's a believer in open source software and he enjoys staying, uh, staying up to date with current technology and working on his own side projects. He's been a Hackforge member since its founding in 2012. Uh, his specialties are front and back end development, API development, JavaScript, TypeScript, Node.js, Python, and Rust. I would also like to highlight that uh, Randy uh, was the one who prepared the repository for everyone's available uh, use. So a very, a very important resource for you uh, to start off with, absolutely, to get kicked off with this. All right, let me come back to my notes. Okay, so let's move forward to uh, a little bit about open source. So why are we using open source software, if anyone's curious? Well, uh, I have a quick little video. Um, yeah, if you, beautiful. Lauren, you anticipate everything. 
<laughs> Great, I'll pull this up. Okay. Much of the software that powers the world's largest companies, protects our personal data, or encrypts national security information is open to the public. Anyone can download the source code behind Facebook's user interface, Google's Android operating system, or even Goldman Sachs' data modeling program, and use it as a building block for a totally new project. What's more, lots of the software is actually developed collaboratively, created and maintained by an army of thousands, from unpaid volunteers to employees at competing tech companies. As a kid in a small town in Virginia, I could get connected to the best developers anywhere on earth and learn from them and even read the code that they'd written. Uh, I really wanted to give back and I, these people were always my heroes. So I, I wanted to participate too. And my voice mattered. It was just immediately, uh, I was hooked. This is the collaborative world of open source software where code is written and shared freely. If individuals catch a bug or see an opportunity for improvement, they can suggest changes to the code and thereby become a contributor to some of the biggest software projects on Earth. But this model hasn't always been the norm. At the dawn of the internet era through the late 1990s, proprietary software proliferated. Microsoft even went so far as to call open source un-American and bad for intellectual property rights. Software was a finite commodity that people hoarded and wanted to sell as a product. Open source software was only developed and maintained by a dedicated few. And there was this fringe world, there was this academic world, who were creating software according to their own rules and sharing it publicly and making it free. Certainly dreamed, like, wouldn't it be awesome if we could sort of take over the world? Now, open source has, essentially, taken over the world. Companies in every industry, from Walmart to ExxonMobil to Verizon, have open sourced their projects. Microsoft has completely changed its point of view and is now seen as a leader in the space. And in 2016, the US government even promised to open source at least 20% of all its new custom developed code. So w whether you know it or not, you are relying on the volunteer labor in many cases of thousands of strangers from around the world. Okay, beautiful. Thank you, Lauren, if you don't mind bringing back the presentation. Okay, perfect, thank you. Okay, great. So yeah, that's just a little bit of introduction. Um, so sometimes it's quite surprising to, to see uh, if you're not in directly involved in open source, just how prevalent it is in our, in our lives, in our world, in the software that we use. But there's some pretty good reasons why we choose to do this. So first is growth and flexibility. Access to source code provides a greater level of control, customization, as well as learning and training opportunities through uh, your community, all working on the same project. It's free for all to, for, it's free for all to contribute. Uh, in terms of innovation, it promotes innovative climate and community through shared ownership of these uh, technologies. It is robust because there's strength in numbers. Open source software um, is tested by an entire community who may use the source for a variety of projects. Therefore, I think the scope of testing can often be quite broad. Additionally, the long-term stability and support is usually pretty good. Open source software often doesn't see knowledge silos, which are um, a high risk, which, which are usually kept by high, uh, individuals in projects uh, uh, like more closed projects. So if an individual with all the knowledge leaves a project, that knowledge is all lost. So we don't see those kinds of silos occurring in OSS. And finally, the buy-in. Lower costs like this equals a lower buy-in threshold for developers and users. And again, that kind of promotes a sense of shared ownership, which is a strong motivator. And that helps to build quality into these kinds of projects. Okay, thanks, Lauren. That's what uh, that's my that's my bit there. I'll pass it back to you. Thank you so much, Chris. So while this event is, of course, focused on writing code, there's a little bit more to it than that. We're also focused on community building. So we have a few events that are going on throughout the next five weeks to help facilitate some of these goals. 
The first one is happening next Saturday, May the 7th from 3 to 5 p.m. in Ford City. C3 Tech is taking part in the Jane's Walk Festival. This is a citizen-led festival of walking tours that happens in over 300 cities. This year, Jane's Walk has, I believe it is 15 walks total. There is a combination of in-person and online events. We are taking part by hosting something a little bit different than what is generally seen as part of Jane's Walk. We're going to be introducing users to OpenStreetMaps and teaching them how to log their own traces and points of interest. This will allow the general community to help build out the available information about their neighborhood on OpenStreetMaps and therefore on windsoresccycling.ca. So this should be a fun one. You'll have to make sure to download the proper apps for your phone. There are different ones for Android and Apple. They are, the suggested links are available on the James Walk website if you want to check those out. If you're a developer who is going to be working with this OSM data, but you perhaps have not seen OSM before, you don't know how it works, this is a great opportunity for you to get a sense of where all of this information you're working with really comes from. So please consider joining us for that. It will be a half hour walk starting in front of City Cyclery at 3 p.m. We will meet again, uh, rounding it all up at 4 p.m. at Pressure Drop. Afterwards, we are all, well, everyone is welcome to at least, meet me in Pressure Drop for a couple drinks and some discussion of how that information can get from your phone onto OSM. The following Saturday, we will be working in partnership with Bike Windsor Essex and Justin from Tourism Innovation on a community bike ride. Since this entire project is focused on how to make cycling better, it only makes sense that we all get out and actually spend some time on our bikes. So we're going to be meeting in Kingsville in front of the Recre Carnegie Recreation Center, I believe is the name, uh, on around 10 a.m. So if you visit the Hackforge website, H-A-C-K-F dot O-R-G, all of the information about where to meet and when is posted there. Make sure to bring your own bike, safety equipment, drinks, and snacks. This is going to be very casual, non-competitive. We're going to go as fast as the slowest rider, so don't worry about whether or not you are up to it. You totally are. It's going to be great. We are also holding a close event on Saturday, June the 4th from probably 1 to 4 p.m. Details to be announced. Hopefully, we can run that as a hybrid virtual in-person event, but you, know, you guys all know how the world is. We have to see how that goes. So during this event, all of the participants will have the opportunity to present their projects and to talk about how it fits the C3 Tech mandate of improving the cycling experience in Windsor and Essex County. The judges will deliberate and by the end of the event, we will know who is walking away with each of the $500 prizes. So that should be a fun one. Stay tuned for that. Every Sunday, starting next week from 2 to 3.30 p.m., we'll be holding virtual gatherings on Zoom. These are not required for participants, but we do highly encourage everyone to attend. These will each have a different theme for each week, and we will have the opportunity for the participants to learn from experts, share ideas, get advice, and connect with other technology and cycling enthusiasts in their community. So the link for that one will be the same for every week and it is being emailed out as part of the follow up to our launch email, which will be happening once we close out today. So with that, let's move over to some of the more fun stuff and get a few more voices joining us here today. So this is where we get into our round table. So I want to introduce the people we're going to be hearing from. First off, we have Jess Bondi. Jessica is a community advocate and member of the Windsor Bicycling Committee. She oversees food services at the Welcome Center Shelter for Women and Families. In 2021, Jessica was named an Ontario Community Changemaker by 880 Cities for her work co-founding Activate Transit Windsor Essex, a grassroots advocacy group working for a more accessible and sustainable transportation system in the region. So for anyone unfamiliar with 880 Cities, 
This is an organization that is really, really a strong believer of the fact that if your city is suitable for people of age eight and age 80, you are doing things right. And Jess's work definitely helps to contribute to that. At We uh, Activate Transit Windsor Essex recently released the results of a survey the data of which was collected last year and it is really really cool to check out so i highly recommend looking them up our other uh, panelist today we have justin who has been developing innovative and award-winning tourism initiatives for over 20 years and he currently leads tourism innovation lab an incubator created to find foster and support new tourism ideas and entrepreneurs through seed grants and mentorships. The lab and its SPARK program were launched in Windsor, Essex in 2018 and have now expanded to regions across Ontario and British Columbia. And as Justin mentioned earlier, the Tourism Innovation Lab is a program of Hackforge. Doug Sartori, lead consultant at Parallel 42 Systems, we've heard from and about him already. So rather than reading a Doug bio, I'm going to recommend that everyone check him out on at least one of his podcasts, the weekly Rose City Politics, or the periodic Mean, Median, and Moose, which is entirely devoted to data. Super cool. Definitely check that one out. So today we are having this roundtable discussion. The way it's going to work, I'm going to ask one question to someone in particular. After that person finishes their answer, we are going to give the other two panelists the option to respond if they could be agreeing not agreeing have a completely different take let's see what happens so to start us off today i'm going to ask a question of jessica jess how can active transportation methods such as cycling fit into a regional transit plan for windsor and essex county um, thank you for the question, Lauren. And so I think that uh, active transportation can fit in with regional transit plans because when you look at transit as a service, uh, there's really a gap within what they call the last mile. Uh, and and so cycling uh, can definitely help fill that gap by getting you to and from the the bus station essentially, or the bus stop, sorry, which is the the last mile of your, or the first mile maybe of your, um, your travels. And so cycling and transit really, uh, go hand in hand and as we you know look to improve transit services uh we in partnership to that are looking to improve cycling services as well um, not just as a means to to help commute, but just, you know, so people are less likely to want to choose their car over um you know, over any other option, whether that be cycling or transit. And so, you know, cycling really uh, helps us promote transit usage by helping close the gaps, um, you know, so that there's, you know, if you, for me, for example, I have a 10 minute walk to the nearest bus stop. And so, when I am taking the bus, um, which doesn't happen so often when I have two little ones running around, uh, but when I do look to take the bus, uh, cycling is is a part of that because it helps make that 10 minute walk to the bus stop a two minute bike ride. And so uh, the two of them go hand in hand to sort of close those gaps. Excellent, thank you, Jess. Let's ask Justin next. Do you have anything to add or challenge in Jess's response? Um, certainly, I'm on the same page as everything that you mentioned would concur with a, a lot of that. And, and I'm a um, frequent transit user in the region as well. Um, and from a tourism perspective, you know, oftentimes we forget about the needs of people, you know, who might be in the region without a car as well um, to be able to get around. Uh, I will highlight that there is uh, just one example, um, which I think is a great opportunity that should be expanded from a transit perspective. Um, yesterday, I took the Leamington to Windsor bus number 42, um, which operates, I think, um, three or four times a day in each direction between Leamington, Kingsville, Essex, and St. Clair College in South Windsor. Um, 
the service runs from Monday to Saturday, not on Sunday, unfortunately. Um, uh, but, but anyways, uh, you know, something for everybody to consider in terms of the multimodal opportunities and making it easier for people to, with their bikes, um, be able to access transit services and travel at greater distances across our region. Uh, so for example, um, taking the bus one way into Windsor and then having the opportunity or choice to ride back um, um, to the original destination uh, or even in both directions. Uh, also um, that, you know, when there's rain, you know, if I'm traveling by bike in and around uh, Windsor and a huge thunderstorm hits, having uh, the ability to be able to transfer onto a, a bus, for example, um, to be able to, you know, get to my destination, you know, dry is something that's important too. So um, just some, some thoughts around that. Uh, and I don't know, um, you know, one thing that I just will put out there as well, I find, um, you know, taxis and taxi services are, are sometimes um, forgotten uh, in terms of the opportunities that they present um, for, uh, you know, again, if there's inclement weather, uh, you have a, a flat tire in the middle of nowhere uh, in the middle of Essex County. Um, we certainly have some uh, of that, those options that can also fill some of those gaps as well. So uh, some additional thoughts there. Awesome. Thank you, Justin. Doug, do you have anything you would like to add to either of those responses? Some uh, really great thoughts um, and uh, I'm generally in agreement. The only thing I want to add uh, is that I think there is a role that technology can play in um, coordinating between different modes of transportation. Um, that, the, you know, that last mile um, stuff that Jess was talking about is, um, I think, really important. And it's really important to know when to actually transit that last mile, when to get on your bike uh, so that you're going to um, catch that bus and so forth. And um, the City of Windsor does provide uh, live GPS updates um, for transit buses. And uh, there are a number of applications that um, that uh, support that and provide that information in a way that you can um, that you can access, and it's also maybe a bit of inspiration for our participants. Um, things that um, things that you might want to incorporate in your application. So, just by way of example, I'm just dropping in the chat a link to one application that actually uses. Um, that information in a way that um, might be very useful for someone who is thinking about when I should get on my bike in order to um, in order to get to that bus stop in time and will there be a spot for me on that bus all information that that app can provide um, and something that you as a participant in the hackathon might want to consider um, how you can incorporate this kind of information in your own work. Excellent. Thank you, Doug, and thank you for that awesome link. Jess, now that those two have had a chance to kind of speak on your response, anything else that you want to to add or follow up with from that? Uh, yeah, actually, I was just Justin's response sort of got my my wheels turning. And, uh, you know, I, I've always thought that it's such a missed opportunity that we don't have a bike or a bus going out to Kingsville because a perfect pairing of cycling and uh, taking transit would be to access the wineries in the region. And, you know, such a good opportunity for, for tourism, you know, if there was transit that went all the way out to Kingsville to sort of connect the dots, because a lot of the times people don't want to be driving uh, and doing a wine tour at the same time. And a cab can be rather expensive. Uh, and so, you know, that's just another opportunity where transit can help, uh, you know, be, be able to pr close that gap, but also uh, allow us to be able to enjoy cycling throughout the region. So, yeah, thank you. Love it. Thank you so much, Jess. So last call on that question, Doug, Justin, anything else you want to add there before we move on? Yeah, go ahead, Justin. I just wanted to um, clarify because I learned this yesterday. So the, again, the Leamington um, Windsor bus, it does stop in Kingsville. So that's where I pick it up. Yeah, so it goes from Leamington, Kingsville, picks you up at the arena, Essex um, at their arena, and then ends at the um, St. Clair College uh, in South Windsor. So um, that being said, you know, it doesn't operate on Sundays, which is a popular time for people to visit. So I'm all for advocating 
uh, improved service and um, you know again you know whether you're a transit rider walking onto the bus or you have a bike and you put it on the bike rack you know it's it's really as, as Jess mentioned it just makes total sense um, and also just if anyone's planning to use it I learned this because I don't believe it was listed on the website um, currently Windsor Transit's running the service on Saturday's Saturday schedule. So the schedule online is incorrect. Um, so just know that. Uh, I found that out thankfully without getting up at like five in the morning to catch the first bus. Um, so anyways, if you're interested, but I highly recommend it um, as well. So anyways, just wanted to follow up on that, but um, I think it's a great service and it should be expanded, you know, even to places like Colchester. Um, and I know that there are other routes that connect with like LaSalle uh, and Amherstburg as well. Fantastic. That is a really great addition. It's always nice to know when we cannot trust the information online. I would definitely have fallen for that. So thank you for that update. <laughs> uh, all right. So with then that, let's with that then, let's move on to Justin's question. So Justin, what opportunities do improved active transportation routes offer to the region's tourism industry specifically? All right, thanks, Lauren. Um, so yeah, so when I read that question, the first phrase, which is common, that came to mind that we uh, share with many partners that we work with uh, is that bikes mean business. So from a um, perspective of the, the tourism economy, our local economy, bikes mean business. Uh, so improved and extensive active transportation routes throughout the region will only um, uh, allow more people to, to ride safely through the region. It will attract more visitors to the region uh, for cycling, whether it's that their primary purpose or if they just happen to, as, as Jess mentioned again, um, you know, the great wine tours that operate throughout our region that uh, really, you know, uh, as I said, when I introduced myself at the beginning, um, there's no reason why Windsor-Essex uh, should not be one of the leading cycle tourism destinations. Uh, we have the climate, we have the topography that makes it accessible um, for most, uh, almost everyone. Um, and we have, you know, a, a collection of amazing attractions and landscapes and parks and uh, cities, et cetera. We all know, we all know that list. Um, I also wanted to just share, so in terms of, uh, again, the question you said, what opportunities do active transportation routes offer the region region's tourism industry. Um, certainly there are some amazing uh, businesses out there that are supporting that. Uh, we're all, you're all likely familiar with Windsor Eats. Uh, so they've been uh, in this world for a long time promoting uh, wine trail rides, Friday night lights, if, if anyone's interested, I heard those are coming back this year. So check them out. Um, other, other types of tourism businesses like the Grove Hotel last year started renting um, um, battery assisted bikes. Uh, so, you know, really overnight uh, in my area of Kingsville, you saw them all over the place, groups, you know, having an amazing time exploring. Um, I mentioned the winery tours. We do have a number of uh, signature cycling routes. One is the Great Lakes Waterfront Trail, which if you're not familiar, connects all the way from Quebec to Lake Superior. Uh, and it's a fantastic route. Um, and also, so I didn't forget, if you're not familiar with Ontario by bike, um, that is another, um, or that's essentially the, the provincial tourism group that's promoting cycle tourism. So they do certifications for businesses, et cetera. So uh, with all that to be said, um, I think the, the routes, um, at least in Essex County, um, have improved immensely from a, a infrastructure perspective, safety perspective over the last 10 years. Certainly there's more work to be done and I know CWADS um, uh, has outlined those plans. Um, I think you know, the discussion around the digital tools um, are so important. So that's why the Tourism Innovation Lab was really excited to, to support this initiative and be part of the session today. And then I'll also add, it's kind of a low tech thing, but I think it ties in with the digital tools is the importance of uh, wayfinding signage. So how people, when they're riding, uh, are able to either follow using a digital tool, um, the guidance, you know, through this, uh, or, you know, in terms of their real world, um, you know, physical signs that allow them to know 
when to turn, you know, uh, any, any other kind of obstacles, things like that. So just wanted to flight that. And sorry, I think I'm talking too long. Um, I also was just going to encourage people, if you haven't, uh, as you're thinking about your solutions, one thing that I often tell um, our partners that are keen to develop cycle tourism is to go to an area. So maybe if you're in Windsor, come down to Kingsville, join us for that community ride on May 14th and um, explore on your own. And, and it's really, it changes the perspective. So when you don't have the mind map of exactly like the routes and where to turn and all of that stuff, it's good to be in a place that you're very unfamiliar with and be a cycle tourist. And, and you'll, it'll give you that real world sense of, you know, how the digital tools will be able to help you, what's missing, you know, what routes, what kind of conditions were helpful, not helpful, all of that stuff. So um, just, just to say that uh, as well. That was an extremely thorough response, Justin. Thank you for that. So I do have a quick lightning round-esque follow-up question for you on that that I didn't prepare you for because I want your genuine reaction to this, okay? I have feelings on what I'm about to show you and I'm so curious about yours. This is the pedal pub. They are common in Detroit. People will have drinks while working bike pedals that propel this whole contraption forward. What are your thoughts on this and its viability in our region? You're asking me first? Yeah, this is you okay. specifically. Oh, great. Oh, me specifically. <laughs> okay, yeah. And as you mentioned, I hadn't mentioned it. Um, yeah, well, I see this, um, you know, as just a, a tourism opportunity attraction, um, you know, that is maybe you could say similar to the duck tours, if you're familiar with those in the U.S., um, kind of the specialized bus, amphibious bus things. Um, I think they, they're fun. Um, <clears throat> And that, yeah, I mean, I think um, it, it's, it's a fun special event type of thing. I think, uh, I don't know, I'd be curious to hear what the others um, thought. Um, it's been a while since I've been to Detroit, two years. I'm definitely going back very soon. And, and I would also say Detroit's awesome exploring by bike. Um, but uh, yeah, I know that um, people enjoy this and, and it involves a sort of cycling. Uh, as a group. So um, yeah, I think it's very unique, but interested to hear the others. Thank you for playing along with that with me, Justin. Uh, I very much appreciate it. Uh, I, I tried not to, but I really couldn't help it. So <laughs> let's now go ask Doug your opinions on not just the Pedal Pub, but active tourism, active transit and tourism in general in Windsor, Essex. Okay, I have no opinion on the pedal pump. <laughs> you <laughs> would get me on one. <laughs> but if people like it, that's good for them. Um, the uh, Justin gave a terrific comprehensive answer. Just a couple things that I, I would like to point out. Um, one, in terms of the opportunity that um, that is there for businesses across Windsor Essex um, in, in cycling and tourism combined, um, the Gordie Howe Bridge is set to open in just a little bit over two years. And it's going to have um, accommodation for both cyclists and uh, pedestrians. So um, that I think presents a tremendous opportunity uh, for businesses across the region and um, businesses that rely on tourism or think that they can tap into tourism um, should really be thinking about how they can advocate for um, continued improvement in cycling infrastructure in both the city and the county uh, to take advantage of um, what will surely be an influx of curious US-based cyclists coming across the border after that bridge opens. And, and I think that we would be, um, it would be a good idea for, um, for us to put our best foot forward and have as much infrastructure and support for cyclists when they first come across the border in 2024, as much of that ready uh, as we possibly can. Um, and, and the other point I wanted to make is just that um, there are so many opportunities for um, hackathon projects to um, to tap into the potential of cycling tourism um, and one of the reasons why uh, we built this this um, the solution and built the tech stack for the solution um, 
in the way that we did relying on open street map data specifically is that um, when you update the data in open street map every application that uses it will get that data um, integrated into it so that means that for businesses across this region when you update osm um, when you make sure that your business is registered on osm as an amenity or um, provide your bit of contribution to OSM data, that's not just folks who know about a local app and download it. That's anyone coming to this city who, um, who uses a map-based application. It probably in, is relying on open street data map data in some way um, and and they're going to see that benefit and that's one of the reasons why in this project we have advocated for um, improving the quality of data on osm and um, helping businesses and others in the city and in the county um, put their data on the map and so hackathon participants just think about that and keep that in your mind and when you're um, when you're conjuring up your ideas for your um, your hackathon entry that um, there might well be an opportunity there um, in terms of of um, the source data that is hopefully getting richer every day that's a lovely response doug thank you jess do you have any thoughts you want to add to either of those answers and feel free to include your pedal pub opinions, I feel like you're going to have some. I'm not going to lie to you, the pedal pub terrifies me <laughs> because uh, I'm very clumsy. <laughs> and so there's nothing <laughs> like you could not pay me to get on a pedal pub. Uh, but again, I will kind of echo what Doug said. A lot of people will find that very fun. Uh, and so, you know, do I think we could support something like that in our region? I, you know, if you want to try it out, they're only in Detroit, but you know, I, I feel like if we had one or two pedal pubs in, in the region, we probably could uh, uh, fill them up, at least in the summertime. So uh, <laughs> viability of pedal pubs, uh, you know, that aside, uh, I personally am very apprehensive just because of my own uh, personal clumsiness. So um, besides that, I mean, I think Justin gave a fantastic response and I um, I've sort of already thrown in my two cents about how, you know, uh, tourism can be improved, you know, cycling can help uh, connect tourism out there, you know, with my um, transit to cycling wine trail ride excursion that I uh, <laughs> that I came up with there. So, um, you know, I don't really have any any new thoughts to put forward on that, but that's my uh, two cents for what it's worth. Lovely. Thanks, Jess. So, Justin, now that you've heard the response from Jess and Doug, anything that you want to add? Uh, maybe just to challenge uh, Jess and Doug to come with me to Detroit and uh, try firsthand the the um, the beer bike or whatever it's called. Um, <laughs> and Lauren, you join too, or anyone here, we could do like a a group tour um, just to check it out. Yeah, um, for research, you know, again, right? For research, exactly. <laughs> That's right. I see some thumbs up, hands up. <laughs> um, yeah, anyways, I think, um, you know, we've covered it, but again, uh, from a tourism perspective, cycle tourism perspective, having um, a well established safe network um, for people of uh, different abilities, having that uh, opportunity for multimodal transportation so that people can access different parts of the region, uh, but still, you know, riding uh, bikes for part of the way uh, and, you know, supporting and, and I guess through this project highlighting those businesses that are um, supporting cycling in our region. So, you know, the tour companies, for example, like Windsor Eats, the bike rental companies, the accommodations, anybody that might be part of Ontario by bike, um, you know, having that information on this open map would be really helpful, I think, for, for all users. And um, so I wanted to, I, I know I talked about signage, uh, but I know, you know, one of the things on the list about this project was identifying routes, you know, where maybe there's a truck always parked in the bike lane or, you know, if there's a condition issue. Um, I think another one is if there's an issue, you know, people should be able to identify, you know, where a sign's missing. There's nothing worse than, you know, on a bicycle riding along a beautiful country road and not realizing that, you know, the cycling route actually turns left, but that sign is 
not there. And then you end up riding like, you know, an hour out of your way. The rain starts, you know, all of the, from a tourism or visitor experience, um, that's not very good. So, uh, so highlighting those on the map, I think would be really helpful. Any deficiencies, whether it's the route, signage or anything else would be really helpful. That is an excellent point on missing signage. Thank you so much for, for bringing that up. I'm making note of that. And that's something that I will add in that if we don't address it this round through the hackathon, perhaps in our fall hackathon, we can get someone to tackle that one there. So thank you for that. Okay, coming up next then is our question for Doug. So Doug, in order for technology to play a role in creating a culture of active transportation in Windsor, Essex, we will have to address the digital divide. That is the gap between the haves and the have nots when it comes to technology. How can our local municipalities help to improve the ability of all resident, residents to access digital tools like those being created during this event? Well, it's a big question. Um, so the, you know, access to digital technology, I think is something that's really important and it's a pressing equity issue across the board. Um, we have some organizations in our community uh, like Computers for Kids. I wanna um, call those folks out specifically because they do, um, they do collect, um, recycle electronics, including um, computers, tablets, and so forth. And they do turn around and provide those um, to in need families. So that's something that um, I think helps in terms of what the municipality could do. Um, I think rather than focus on hardware, um, municipalities should be thinking about access to high speed internet for all residents. Um, I, I think that municipal broadband is an idea that has been tried in many communities with great success. Um, there is no reason why a community like Windsor um, can't uh, can't adopt that, um, or other communities, county communities as well. Um, that's an area where I think it's worth exploring and thinking about what um, the provision of high speed internet and particularly uh, open and publicly accessible Wi Fi, um, how that might be an accelerator for um, the adoption of digital technology by residents and the use of it uh, by residents uh, at all different income levels and life situations. Um, we already have uh, in down Downtown Windsor, um, free Wi-Fi that is provided by, I believe, the, um, the Downtown Windsor BIA. That is a model program that um, could be expanded and provided to other parts of the city and even beyond the city into the county. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing that I think um, that uh, municipalities should be focused on is um, continuing to develop their, um, their public open data infrastructure. Um, Windsor in particular was a leader in open data when it first became a movement among Canadian municipalities seven, eight, nine years ago. Um, in fact, we were one of the top municipalities in Canada um, in terms of the ranking of open data portals. We've, we've slowed our, um, our investment in recent years. Um, we no longer have uh, that sort of state of the art reputation across um, across the country in terms of Windsor's open data portal. Um, and, and I think that Windsor and the county municipalities could, um, with a small investment in improving the quantity and quality of data um, that's available and um, engaging the community as, um, as the city of Windsor and a bicycling committee and CWATS have done um, with this technology initiative. So I think more stuff like this is a good idea and a bigger investment in open data. Love it. Thank you, Doug. Sorry for giving you such a more in-depth question than everyone else. Any obvious question, you've already answered a few times throughout this event, so it is what it is. So with that, Justin, do you have any thoughts to add to what Doug was speaking on there or just about the digital divide in general? Um, definitely not my, my expertise, but I will say just from some of the things I've been working on um, uh, that, you know, there are many people that don't have access to digital platforms or digital um, tools, uh, whether they're, um, you know, some of our older community population, um, different income levels, younger people, etc. So, yeah, it's trying to figure out you know, how to engage and include. Uh, those um, to either, you know, use the tools, but also create them as well. You know, as we're saying, 
um, you know, how, how is that possible? And I like the idea of um, uh, broader uh, Wi-Fi networks. Um, you know, it's already been mentioned that in sometimes you're in the middle of the country and if you're using a digital tool, but there's no Wi-Fi, there's no, not even Wi-Fi, but just no cell service, which I've encountered, um, you're kind of out of luck. So, um, so that would be good. Uh, and also from an international traveler perspective, you know, we all know if we've traveled to Detroit, for example, you don't always buy a package, so you have uh, internet, so you can access these tools. So, you know, on the flip side over here, we have, and, and I'm glad, thanks Doug for mentioning the Gordie Howe Bridge. Uh, absolutely, that's a huge opportunity and something that, you know, just from a PR perspective, once it's built, uh, encouraging people to visit is, is incredible, yeah, so. Uh, but you know, many of those people may not have um, you know data plans. So how will they be able to use these digital tools uh, as well? So yeah, some additional thoughts there. Thank you, Justin. Jess, anything that you would like to add? Um, I just, I mean, first of all, kudos to Doug for giving such a thoughtful answer to such a difficult question. Um, in my experience you know um serving people that are experiencing homelessness i've obviously come face to face with this issue uh pretty frequently and uh you know even if it's something as simple as like you know them trying to be able to figure out what bus they need to get to to get to a viewing um you know and having to figure that out well maybe they can't pull up the the transit map because they don't have data and things like that so yeah it, it, that's definitely something that i i've seen and, and i really um sort of appreciate because when when you asked the question i was like oh how would i answer this one and and i you know didn't have half as good of a response as what doug had and i really do like the, that idea of sort of being able to provide more um open wi-fi um you know whether that be you know citywide or just providing more wi-fi hotspot areas like they do in the downtown area just to be able to um you know allow people to have that connectivity um yeah i thought that was a really great response um and i and i think the only thing that i really wanted to add is you know when we talk about developing this cycling mapping tool um the ability to use this tool offline, that's sort of where that becomes very important as well. Um, whether it's because they've lost connectivity or they don't have access to it uh, because they don't have a data plan. Um, but if they're able to, you know, sort of download the map to where they want to go um, and, you know, still have that access to it when they when they don't have um, the ability to connect to Wi-Fi. I think that's why, um, you know, Lauren, I, I heard you mention that at the beginning there. It, it, that speaks to me as, as why that would be very and a very important feature to have. Um, and so really, I, I don't have much else to add to that, but just, uh, you know, that that being that, you know, if, if they could access this offline, then it would sort of help, uh, you know, bridge that gap a little bit. Excellent. Thank you, Jess. Doug, now that you've heard those two additions to your response, anything else you would like to add? Um, I, I think we covered it pretty well. Um, I'm, I'm pretty happy with the collaborative effort on that question. It was a very good one. Absolutely. So I would like to give a few minutes now to open it up to our attendees today. So those of you in the audience, if you have a question that you would like to ask to a specific roundtable participant or the panelists at large, please feel free to enter it in the chat and I will read it out for them. We'll see what kind of responses we get. So I'll give you all a few minutes to type that in in case you have any interest in doing so, maybe not a few minutes. That feels like a very long time uh, in, uh, in Zoom call land. In the meantime, I will read out a comment that we received during those responses from Tom Olmsted. He says that it is very important that bike route signage and bike maps do not lead cyclists onto stressful traffic roads that most consider to be uncomfortable. Absolutely, Tom. I think that came out around the time that Justin was talking about missing signs that lead people astray on those cycling routes. So for sure, that is a really, uh, that is a really important point we want to make sure we have there. So what I'm going to do now is reshare my screen. 
is this one. Okay, so for anyone in attendance today, whether you are a participant, a judge, roundtable participant, however, if you need to get in touch with anyone regarding the C3 Tech project, my contact information is lauren at hackf.org. If you would like to get in touch with either of our tech managers, you can reach out to either Chris or Randy. Their email addresses are also listed on the screen there. Alan, I see that you have your hand up. So you can go ahead and unmute yourself if you would like. And uh, let's hear what you've got to say. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. All right. I, I'm a computer programmer, but I'm not totally familiar with the tech stack that is involved here. I'm wondering, is there somebody in this team that could be like, guide me through setting up the uh, technology so that let's say I have a working app and there's something that I can start with. Otherwise I could spend the imagine a whole week just figuring out how to get something working. Absolutely, yes. So Randy, who is not on the call today, will be an excellent asset in setting that up. So what you can do, Alan, is when I send out the follow-up email to this afternoon's event, it will include a form through which you can book time with specific mentors. So I would recommend that you schedule some time with Randy. He has, I think his soonest availability is Tuesday morning, but Randy also has the most availability out of anyone. So you can pick a time that works for you and he'll be able to walk you through what's going on and help to get you set up. Randy's an excellent teacher and I'm confident he'll be able to get you where you need to be. Does that sound all right? Yes, that sounds good. Lovely, thank you. So Alan, you actually like even got past where I was with that. So if we do have anyone else with questions specific to the hackathon, please feel free to ask those now. You can do as Alan did and unmute yourself, ask them out loud. You can add them in the chat, however you prefer. Give it a minute to do that. And Doug, you make a really good point of appreciating everyone's interest in the hackathon and joining a Zoom call on Sunday afternoon. We actually did get lucky that it's not super nice outside. So, you know, people aren't out riding their bikes instead, which is good. <laughs> so with that, thank you everyone for attending today. A huge thanks to our sponsors, judges, mentors, roundtable participants, and of course, everyone who signed up to participate in this hackathon. This is going to be a fun five weeks please feel free to reach out with any questions you have or help you might need. I'm really looking forward to seeing what everyone is able to come up with. Keep an eye out for my follow-up email. Keep an eye on the Hackforge Discord, and we will see where this takes us.